hit record. Okay. Thanks, everybody, coming tonight. Uh, I think we have a really interesting uh, talk tonight, uh, a, a day in the life of a, a thoroughbred racehorse. And uh, what we're really going – I should oh, do a quick intro. My, my name is TK Kugler. For those who don't know it, and considering looking who's online, you all know it. So, um, but uh, – and tonight we have Jesse Cruz, one of our trainers uh, online, and we're talking – uh, we're going to do a talk about the day in the life of of a thoroughbred racehorse, and we're going to concentrate mostly on, uh, and we'll, some of this will get teased out, but we're going to concentrate mostly on uh, sort of what that looks like in the United States, because it's different in other parts of the world, and we're going to concentrate on horses that are actively in training, meaning they're at a racetrack. <laughs> not, you know, laid up on a farm or something like that, or a broodmare, which are obviously uh, also thoroughbred racehorses, but they, uh, they're they at a different stage in their career. But tonight, we're going to talk about horses that are at a racetrack and what their life looks like. And so, Jesse, just to kick it off, um, you know, what time in the morning at most racetracks does a day start for the horse? Okay. Uh, well, for most people, it depends on whether they feed breakfast or not. Uh, so if typically if you feed breakfast, you're doing it around three o'clock in the morning or so. So you'll have a, a groom or, or the trainer themselves, but mostly a groom will come back. We'll start the morning off and give everybody some breakfast at three in the morning. Um, and then usually most of the work really starts happening about four o'clock. Uh, grooms will start cleaning the stalls and taking their bandages off and, uh, you know, getting them up up and ready for the day usually about four uh but like i said if you're going to feed breakfast usually you start that about three and one of the questions i've gotten a million times from people who are like may not know you know racing except for you know watching the kentucky derby once a year why and when i tell them how it's sort of how early it starts why do why does why does it start so early um, when it's dark, why does it start so early in the day for racehorses at the track? So the main reason at the racetrack is that we train over the same racetrack that we, we race on. So most racetracks start racing, you know, at one, one, tw 12 o'clock, depending on, um, depending on, you know, the time of year. Um, so you only have a, a short amount of time to, to train your horses in the morning you only have about four hours really depending on which racetrack you're at and and their schedule but most racetracks open for training between 5 30 in the morning and 6 and they close for training at 10 30 or 11 so you only have a, a short window of time to, to train your horses so to be able to get them all out efficiently and and be able to do it with taking your time with each individual horse you have to start at four in the morning um you know, because then at 11 or 1030, whichever racetrack you're at, will then close for training. And then the maintenance people will start watering and heroin the track to get ready for the races that afternoon. Where other countries or other people that train off of farms and things like that can kind of train all day. Um, they have, a, you know, they're not racing at the facility that they're training at. Now, we were stay with at Pimlico, where they don't race most of the year, but it pretty much just stays the same because it keeps everybody on the same routine here in the States. Uh, you know, even though we're not racing there, the racing starts at, at Laurel at, at one o'clock or so. So we have to get done training in the morning. And then if we have horses, then we got to get down the road to the, to the races uh, down at Laurel. So that's typically why we have to start so early in the morning. Yep, yep, yep. I should mention, um, if you have questions, anyone, you can use the chat function um, at the bottom of uh, the Zoom app. If you just throw up any uh, questions, I, I will work those in for you as we go along here. So, um, so stay on that theme, Jess. You know, breakfast has happened, bandages are done. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, sort of the assembly line of horses getting into that small window you know so how what does an assembly line feel like in a morning okay so so the groom will get there we'll we'll tie the horse to the wall uh which doesn't mean they're actually tied to the wall they're just hooked up so they're not moving around the stall too much so clean their stalls 
and uh, then the uh, groom will start brushing the horse. Uh, they'll clean the horse up and get them ready for the races. Now, my job as the trainer or assistant trainers for other large stables is to make what's called a set list. And a set list is the order of which the horses will go out, which time, and then what they'll do on the racetrack. Um, so for me, I, in our stable, I'm the one that makes the set list. And uh, so the grooms will start getting them brushed up around five. And like here at Monmouth, the track opens up at 5.30, but at Pimlico, it opened up at six. So the first set will be ready to train at six o'clock. The groom will get all the horses, to get them brushed off. And the first horse that's going to go in the, in the first set at, at 5.30 will have his, his bandages on his, in his saddle and bridle. Um, and then, so at 5.30, we'll bring the horse out. The exercise rider will then get on the horse at that point, go to the racetrack, um and do whatever their training is for that day whether it's jog two miles gallop a mile you know gallop a mile and a half i mean whatever the trainer wants them to do if they're going to breeze five eighths you know breeze a half mile which, like i said whatever their training is for that day then they come back um the hot walker and the exercise rider will then unpack the horse and the horse will be passed off to the hot walker the hot walker will then walk a couple turns let them get a sip of water and then they'll go out and the groom will get them a bath. While all of that was happening, the groom, the grooms will also be getting the next horse ready for the next set. Because yet again, you only have the limited amount of time to train them. So everything kind of has to flow pretty smoothly. You have to pretty much have the, the day organized the day before, if that makes sense. But then the, the hot walker will, will walk the horse. Um, the groom will give him a bath. And then the horse will, will finish cooling out. Uh, the horse's legs will get washed off and he'll go back in the stall, uh, you know, and, and lay down basically or eat some uh, hay or this or that. And then we'll go from there with uh, at the end of the day, we'll start putting them in ice and putting bandages back on them. And depending on what what their uh, what their routine for that is. Um, but that's usually how once all the training is done, that's when we start doing that. Mm -hmm. So question for you is. And, and this one, I, I know you're going to go in a bunch of places and, or, and and I'll let you answer it in any way you want. You, you talked about setting that set list and horses are going to do different things. How do you determine what they're going to do that day as a trainer? How, how do you think about that? What, what is your set routine? Um, you know, uh, all of that. Okay, so that that could be thrown into a thousand different things. Yes. So basically, like, so basically, you know, you have your if you start with two year olds, you have two year olds that are typically doing, you know, or just galloping until they're ready to start breezing. But on most days, they're going to gallop between a mile and a mile and a half, um, and you you kind of play that be, between how fit they are, um, and then then you have to work in their their gait schedule in the morning and schooling in the gate and things like that. Um, older horses, depending on what they've done, if they say they just raced and they've, they've come off a race the first few days back, they'll just jog. Um, so all of that depends on each individual horse, um, and exactly determining what the horse is going to do when they're going to breeze determines when, you know, for older horses, you set that up, be, uh, with how the race is, um, say the race is on, say the race is on Jan July you know, fifth, and you want to breeze in six days out, then then you kind of have to plan that ahead of time and breeze six days before. And depending on, you know, if it's a if it's a short race, say it's only a five furlong race or five and a half, you're going to breeze them. You know, me typically, I'm going to breeze them three eighths. Uh, not a real far work. Let them keep them sharp, kind of situation, and have some speed put in them. But now, if you're racing a mile and an eighth, you might breeze them three, you know, three quarters, five eighths just depending on the horse, but all of that is individualized between the horse and our stable, at least. Mm -hmm. um, I know when you get, get into some of the bigger stables, you kind of have a set routine with, with, with them just because it's, there's so many horses in your stable that it, that you have to do that. And you, you individualize it as they, as they get closer to the race. Um, but we can, with our stable not being super big, we can individual it, individualize it every day, pretty much mm -hmm. between each horse. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, uh, but like I said, all that dep depends on on each horse and how far along they are in their their training condition wise, and then how how close they are to their next race. I I, I was, you know, this is a, a, a 
uh, trainers and and uh, trainers really do this all the time and it is a confusing thing um i know i found myself explaining it to people the term training and the term working um sometimes by novices are used interchangeably but in your right. mind in your mind as a trainer if you're saying you're training a horse or you're working a horse what's the difference for you so so for me it, it's working a horse means it's going to get a published work it's going to get a published workout breeze you know where it's working five eighths of a mile a half mile three eighths you know three quarters whichever whatever distance you're breathing them it that that's a published almost i would say you know depending on what you're looking for but an 80 percent speed rate like they're 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 getting they're more than just going out there and galloping um which is what i consider just normal training it's just a normal gallop but if i if i say i'm going out to work a horse he's he's going to go out and have a published breeze um a published workout uh where he's going to go he or she is going to go, you know, at an 80% clip around the racetrack at whichever distance I, I've told the rider to go at. Mm -hmm. um, where just jogging a horse or, or just galloping a horse for the day is just normal everyday training. Mm. Um, you, yeah. One of the things that you, you didn't talk too much about, but uh, come, some other things that happen in sort of in, a, in, a, in the morning um, – what, explain to us uh, sort of uh, hot walking and when does hot walking sort of happen in that assembly line? Yeah, so so like I said, when the horse gets back from the racetrack um, after training, whether it's a work, you know, jogging, galloping, whichever one, you want them – I was always taught – now, everybody's different. There's some people that don't believe in cooling horses out. Um, but the way we do it, is we cool them out now you, you have to think of it as like a runner after they've done they've done a big workout it's almost like a cool down situ situation where they don't just stop right away so their muscles don't tighten up so after they get back the exercise rider and the hot walker will untack the horse and the hot walker will walk the horse for 20 to 30 minutes depending on how how hard the training was uh that day if they if they worked usually it takes them a little longer to cool out and things like that but um but that's when that happens is when they get back from their training uh, mm. for that day. Mm. And, and how many days after a race do you just walk a horse? How do you think about that? Oh. So typically if the horse doesn't have any issues or anything like that, we usually give them three days off is my, my typical thing. Um, if I, but there's times where you, you run a horse that you know is going to get tired in the race or this or that, and you may give them four days or five days depending on – depending on that, that situation. Uh, but usually the, the typical t uh, length is three days. Mm. It's three mm. days after they, they race. They'll have three days of just walking and getting back, uh, you know, kind of getting the, themselves back together. And then also it gives us uh, a time to, to make sure the horse came out of the race well. Um, you know, some, some things that happen to horses injury-wise don't pop up immediately. So it takes a couple of days for them to kind of like settle down and, and then you start seeing things. If, if something were to pop up, it usually takes a few days for that to happen. If it's nothing dramatic wrong with the horse, you know, if it's little nicks or nagging things, um, it doesn't always pop up right away. So you, you take a couple of days just to, just to check them over very thoroughly. So. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you, uh, what happens in the afternoon for afternoon and evening for horses that aren't racing. So, you know, it's, let's not, obviously we know what happens when it's a race day for a horse, but what happens for a horse that's not on a race day in the afternoon and evening? So uh, actually that's pretty uh, funny because our routine has changed a little bit. Now we're back here at, we're up here at Monmouth. Um, I don't know if the people listening have, have ever been to Monmouth park, but in between every barn, every set of barns here mama there's actually a large patch of grass and some trees and things like that so for us typically at Pimlico we'd all come you know my guys would come back and they would pick through the stalls help clean the stall like not really clean the stalls but just just maintain them so they're not too too hard to clean in the morning um and we re, you know feed in the afternoon and another serving of food um and make sure everybody has hay and water 
uh, at normally at Pimlico, that's what we would do. But here at Mammoth, now because there's all this grass, we come back and we pull the horse out of the stall and let them get grass while the guys pick through the stalls and things like that is what what we've been doing, um, which is really nice. And I, I really like that. Uh, but that's typically what an afternoon looks like. And then here in the summer, the guys will come back again about nine o'clock and, and rewater off and make sure everybody has plenty of water. Mm -hmm. um, but usually it's just really relaxing when there's, especially right now, there's no racing here just yet. And like on a day like today, there's, you know, just horses out grazing and things like that, which is just really nice uh, racetrack to be at, to be able to do that with your horses. But that's typically what the afternoons look like is just coming back and, and, and refeeding and, and topping waters off and making sure everybody has enough hay for the night and, and just checking on everybody pretty much. Yeah. I mean, I, I know Delaware is another place where you've got a lot of green right. lights too. So it's, uh, it's uh, not like the concrete jungle that is Pimlico. So that, that is beautiful Pimlico. <laughs> yes, beautiful Pimlico. So uh, is there anyone who's checking in on the horses overnight? Um, or, or generally it, from that sort of 9 p.m. feeding to 3 a.m., no one is there? So for our stable, no. Uh, there's... I mean, Rico actually lives, his, his room is actually in the barn. Uh, so he's there if something goes dramatically wrong. But for, for most of the time, there's, that's usually they're kind of on their own uh, for, the, for the night. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, uh, but there are some large stables that do hire what's called night watchmen, and they're basically a groom, and that's their job is to just check on everybody throughout the night. Um, uh, but usually those are large stables with, you know, 70 to 50 horses or so in the stable at a time. So when you have that many horses together, they usually try to figure out a way to hurt themselves and, and drive those trainers crazy. So it's worth having a person there in the, at, through the nighttime. Yeah. Cool. I got some really good questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to work some of those in right now for you. Gary asked, and this is a, this is a question I've, I've kind of always wondered a little bit and you're going to have, your your life experiences fit in to answer this one, but does, Jesse, uh, does uh, does having night racing mess with the mental state of the horses? Does it does it you know do they even know or do, understand that it's not an afternoon race but it's going to be a night race? So, actually, it, it's really odd. I grew up obviously I grew up in Charlestown where they race at nighttime, and you know, the biggest thing you have to worry about with young horses racing at nighttime is just um, is them, the first time they race underneath the lights. It's it's just like a high school football player. The first night time he plays on Friday night under the lights, you kind of get starstruck a little bit. You look at him a little funny. Um, so that's something you, you, you wouldn't expect you have to worry about, but you really do because it's it's really bright when they when they know it shouldn't be bright. So they're, they're kind of confused by that usually. Um, but as, as, as they get used to that situation, I think they just get used to the routine of it. Um, they don't seem to, it doesn't seem to change. You can take that same horse that's been racing at night and then, you know, ship him down the road and race him at Laurel the next day or, you know, the next couple of weeks or so during the day. Mm. It doesn't seem to phase them too much. The big, the big thing is horses are creatures of habit. So they do, they do fall into a nice routine. So when they do do something a little different, it, it is it is a little bit challenging, but most horses handle it really well. Um, there's just, you know, your select few that do, that do kind of don't like their change in their routines. Mm -hmm. um, the big thing running at night does is put a lot of, it puts a lot of strain on, on your health and, and the, the work you do. Because at Charlestown, if you run in the last race, after getting the horse cooled out, making sure everything's okay, getting bandages put back on them, it is now, you know, close to midnight or a little after. <laughs> and uh, then, like we said, we start at four. So that's, if that's a pretty tough, tough go around. For, it's really for tough if you don't win either, I, I got to tell you. So it's yeah. – uh, if, yeah. you, if you run up the track, it's really pretty crummy, I yeah, got to tell you. It, so. may, it, makes it, it makes it pretty tough when your alarm goes off. <laughs> you know, four hours later. Yes. Um, yes. So, <laughs> so um, 
a question from Carolyn, and I, I, I know the answer to it, but uh, I'll, I'll let you take a crack at it, Jesse. Do you regularly x-ray horses or only if you see something wrong? Mostly when we see something wrong. Uh, you know, you'll x-ray two-year-olds a little, or, a little more often uh, because what we'll x-ray there is their, their growth plates and their knees and seeing how, how they're growing and things like that. Typically, we'll x-ray them, you know, with nothing being wrong, just to check before we move, start moving forward in some, some more serious works. Um, but other than that, no, we, we don't just, just take x-rays of horses just to take x-rays of them. Yeah, um, and, and so speaking, unless, yeah, speaking as an owner, just to give you an owner's perspective, every time we're going to shoot those x-rays, um, I, I just spent 250 to $400. So... You're, yeah, you're, about you're not two hundred fifty dollars per per joint. About yes, two hundred fifty dollars. So if you X-ray both ankles, it's you know five hundred dollars. Right. So both so we're we're not going to do that unless there's some reason to do it. Probably very similar that you same thing with human athletes, thing, right? You're not gonna you're not gonna wind up X-raying people unless uh you know unless there's something there to that you're concerned about. Um, for sure. Um, I will tell you just to Jesse mentioned it in passing in our two year old session that we did uh, a couple of webinars ago. Um, we do x ray a little more frequently when they're at the farm as two year olds um, because we're looking for very specific things before they get to leave the farm, as a matter of fact. So they'll stay on the training farm until they sort of physically um, check some boxes. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that's the case. So, um, uh, let's uh, listen. Uh, question uh, from Chantal, uh, and do you, and we talked a little bit about this, it, it, but I'm gonna phrase her question a little differently. If you could, Jesse, and, and knowing that every racetrack is different and many of these, it doesn't have that, if in the perfect world, do you wish that there were uh, paddocks and, and uh, pastures at your barn um, at the track? Do you, and if so, how would you use them? So it depends on, on, on the size that you're thinking of. You know, I, a, a small paddock is one thing. Like here at Mammoth, you can set up round pins and things like that, which are really nice. See, the difficult situation when you when you think about it like that is that these horses are fed extremely high protein feed. They're as fit as they can possibly be, so they have a ton of energy. Um, so it's a little dangerous just to cut a horse out in a in an open space um, a after coming off a tr right after you know in the middle of their training and things like that. So you don't want to give them it. I, you don't want every racetrack to have large paddocks or a place for them to really get up a head of steam because they can kind of hurt themselves. It's like when you send a horse to the farm, you have to do what's called letting them down a little bit, which is kind of letting them burn off that energy, putting them in a round pen, letting them burn off some energy for a week or so, then move them to a paddock, a small paddock that, like I said, they can't get up a lot of speed in running around in. And then eventually as they, they start to settle down, you, you move them all over into a larger paddock. So, yeah, you, you like to have what we have here in Monmouth, a place where you, can, where you can set up round pens and have grass and things like that. But I don't really need – I don't really look for it to have an actual paddock, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it just depends on the size of what you're, you're, you're talking about. But typically a round pen is, is very – you know, they can't – they can hurt themselves anywhere. So I'm not saying that they can't hurt themselves in a round pen because as – we know they can, like I said, they can hurt themselves just about anywhere at any time. Uh, but a paddock or a round pen is, is, is pretty safe, and it, it definitely does let the horse get out into a little bit bigger area than their stall, get to roll around and, and be a little bit of a horse. I, I do wish that every racetrack did have those um, and did have that option of having that. I, I, you know, just about round pens, I, uh, at our training facility that we're at, in Florida, in Ocala, um, uh, down when I go down and visit there, down and visit. the the round pens there. When they put the horses in a round pen, 
it's actually pretty darn scary to sit there and watch them go around the round pen and be at the opening. You, when they get moving, it's a fairly scary thing to have a an eleven hundred pound horse going in a very relatively small circle at full speed coming right at you. Um, um, it's a scary. It's a. It's it's something. Uh, it's something to. Uh, it's something to uh, to witness for sure. Um, uh, so, uh, a question, um, Jesse, this is a really good question, uh, around bandages and, um, talk to me the differences between how, what you use for bandages on training day compared to race day. Okay. So in the, um, so in the morning we'll use what's, it was typically called, uh, if the race track, say it, it hasn't rained and it, the track's dry we'll use what's called a polo for them to train for the most part. Like if they're just doing a normal training, like a jog or a gallop. Um, and what the polo is for is to, to protect them from hitting themselves in their legs and also from them, what's called running down in their, in their back fat in their back fetlocks. Um, a polo doesn't help so much with them running down because it's not super tight to their legs. Uh, but it's more, more for protection that way that if they don't spook from something or if they're jumping around a little bit, they don't their their shoes don't cut their legs up which little nicks and cuts can can set your horse back a, a week or so so we we try to put those on them now that's if it's dry if the track's dry if the track is is wet you can't really use the polos because the polos will absorb the water and then they slide down and become more dangerous than what you were using them for um so then what we'll, we'll use then is what's called an ace bandage which is basically the same ace bandage you would use to wrap a sprained ankle or a sprained ankle on your on yourself or a sprained wrist on yourself, um, and we'll wrap them with those because they don't absorb as much water or, or hold the mud in, so they don't slide down. Now on race day, we'll we'll use what's called, and also when they breeze, we'll use what's called um, vet wrap, which is I don't I don't know how to explain what a vet wrap is made from, but it's it's a lot it's more tight to the to their skin and it keeps it keeps a lot um it gives them support it's basically just like wrapping your ankle for uh, a sporting event yeah it feels um, more like tape i, I think that the, the difference between right. like a polo feels like you're wrapping yourself your ankle in an ace bandage and vet right. wrap is like you're doing athletic tape i think is the, right exactly. the, that's the probably the analogy <laughs> between the two yeah, exactly. It's like I said, it's, you know, I played sports my whole life. So when we played, you know, football, we get our ankles, our ankles taped and stuff like that before games and, uh, and practice and things like that. So that's what more vet wrap is for is more for high intensity. Also, you know, faster speeds uh, and gives them more support in that, that sense, because it's, like I said, it's tighter to their skin, which helps and support in that way. Yeah. So, and just you know, to give you another perspective and, um, from an owner's perspective, and we're we're obviously a little different than some other owners that we we're involved in the business a little bit. But uh, if you if you're using vet wrap in the morning, uh, you're looking at two dollars a roll. The polos are free. Yeah, two dollars two dollars a leg. Two dollars wow. a leg. So every if we if you're doing vet wrap on every single horse in the barn, you're basically looking at eight dollars a day every single day. And so when you start to think about expenses, um, those are the things, and, and you, you know, what's interesting, you know, I'm, I'm on a side note because, but I think it's interesting, um, our approach, uh, like that's one of those things that we actually um, monitored and documented how much we were using vet wrap or polos, and if there was a way to save money and still be very efficient and always do what's right by the horse, of course. But um, but uh, we those are things that we looked at and uh, and saved money um, in the in the operations of the of it. So it's little things like that 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 sometimes you got to pay attention to as an owner. <laughs> and now most owners aren't even knowing that that's happening. But uh, but in our case, we kind of dug deep into the into the business to understand those things. Um, question from Lauren, and I think it's a, also an interesting question. Y you know, human athletes, and obviously you played sports your whole life, Jesse. Human athletes will often work and train at 
on a, on a semi-regular basis, right? You're going to go full speed. Uh, you know, if, if you're coaching a football team, sometime during that week during practice, you're going to go full speed, right? But that rarely happens with racehorses. Why, why, why is it so rare that they don't go full speed in, uh, very often with racehorses? You, you know, the big thing is just not they're they're running at their athletes, right? So so with football, it's you got to look at them as track stars in that aspect. But so you're not going to ask a, a guy that can run a you know a three minute mile to run a three minute mile three days before or four days before the race. You know what I'm saying? Like you're you, you do he does it at some points, but typically it's all the build up to it. It's it's getting them fit enough to be able to do that. And you just don't want them to, to leave the race. You'll hear trainers say when a horse works too fast or has a published work that's a little faster than what they want, they get upset and you'll hear, hear trainers say, man, I, I, I didn't want him to leave the race in the morning or have the race in the morning where it takes them a little while to recover. You have to remember that they're, you know, 1,100 pound animals. So when they, when they do exert themselves pretty, pretty aggressively, it, it takes a, a little while for them to recover from it. Um, so that's, that's my theory on it, but every trainer is going to be a little bit different and, uh, and, and train their horses in a, a little bit different way. You, you could say, you know, if you're someone that, you know, looks at the history of horse racing in the old days, they used to breeze horses a lot more aggressively and a lot more often. Um, and my theory to that is that we, we breed them differently. Um, they're not as, not as sturdy uh, of a, of an animal as they used to be. So we, we have to to train them a little bit differently, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that's my theory on it. Um, but every trainer is going to give you a different answer um, because everybody trains trains their horses differently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are trainers who also train their horses nearly at full speed on a very regular basis. Um, right. And sometimes have I mean, the vet bills to match it. Right, exactly. And I... I remember TK when you and I were at at Oakland. I pointed out an example to you of at Oakland. We we had the opportunity of being there the first year we were there with only a couple of horses. So you and I would get to get some time to be standing on the rail and watch the other horses train. And I remember pointing out to you. I I, I literally pointed out Matoli, who jogged by for Steve Asmussen, and matoli then turned around and galloped a, a mile and a quarter very slowly with a very small exercise rider on his back and literally at the same time street band for larry jones who is also a grade winning philly jogs by with larry jones himself on who if you don't know larry jones is about six one and pretty close to 200 pounds and he galloped her about a mile and a mile and a half at a very fast pace and every trainer does things very differently. But those are two horses that are both great at stakes winning horses. Matoli obviously was a sprinter of the year and a, a Breeders' Cup sprinter. But it, every trainer is going to be different and give you a different answer on that. Um, but uh, like I said, it's, it's, it depends on, on their style and, and how they, how they want to handle that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So is there – uh, it's a question from Clarence. Question from Clarence. Uh, is, is there a different r- training regimen you use for sprinters compared to routers? Is there a different training regimen that you use for turf horses compared to dirt? So turf to dirt for me, not so much, but distance, yes. Um, typically the horse likes the turf because of its pedigree or its action. It's the action that it, in which it runs in. Um, most turf horses to me and every every horse genius in the world will give you a different answer on what makes a horse a turf horse um but typically obviously it's their breeding that that helps them with it um but you don't really train them train them any different for for the grass that you would for the dirt it just depends on the distance in my opinion um so most sprinters are say they're they're true short distance sprinters you're going to do a little bit more jogging you're going to have that horse a little bit more on his toes and, and not want to get it getting super tired out because their races needs, they need to usually be close to the pace. They need to, you know, have a little bit more of a, a turn of a quick turn of foot where route horses, you, you, you know, you're going to breathe them, you know, long, 
slower five eighths, long slower three quarters, you know, and they'll have long slower gallops and more gallops than they will short just little two two turn jogs and things like that. Uh because they, they need to be more fit to to run those distances, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. No, makes perfect sense. So we've all seen works and get published by Equibase and we see them. Talk to me a little bit about the difference between the terms breezing, handily, and black type work. Okay, so, well, there's not a difference. A horse can work a black type work and breeze handily. Um, You know, you'll get a... So to me, when I say a horse breeze very handily, it means that the rider was wasn't moving a lot the horse was well within himself very hand in in hand if that makes sense the rider wasn't asking the horse to run faster the horse did that on its own where to me if a horse uh but like i said you can get a horse like for us for an example fear the turtle was a horse that will go out and work very fast and the rider doesn't have to do a whole lot with him he's just a, a pretty fast horse so he doesn't have to be be asked to do what he does in the morning um you know, so that's that's my terminology for for what handily means. Now, breezing usually means that the horse, the rider's down, asking the horse to run a little bit, and ask asking him to work. If that makes mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. So I will. But a black, I, like I said, a black top work can be in hand or you know being asked. It just depends on on the horse. Mm-hmm. Um, if you, for me, if I see a horse work, you know, a fast half mile or fast five eighths, and they did it in hand, that's a little bit more impressively. You know, yep. So I, I have said this to many times in our Slack channels, and you guys are probably tired of hearing me say this, but please, when you see timed works in the United States, pay very little attention to the timed work. Um, it's uh, um, we could do a whole, uh, and we might actually do a whole webinar on timed works and what they actually mean or don't mean. But uh, just understand that the, the, a timed work uh, means very little in the United States. Um, it, it's, even possible, yeah. it's even possible that the horse with the timed work um, did not even work. Um, so uh, I, I'll tell the story. We had a horse who unfortunately died and a year later got a timed work published for it, a year after its own death. So... Um, you just never know how those time works um, are getting calculated and figured out at uh, in the United States. The one, the one racetrack that I can say is pretty accurate with their works um, would be, would be mostly Saratoga. Um, they're, they have clockers, three different clockers that are there clocking horses. Uh, and that, but it, you have to remember that that's one of the most major meets in the country. Um, so that that's a place. Now, a couple of racetracks. That sh- uh, one thing Stronic I think has done really well is out in California and at Gulfstream. They've been videotaping all, a lot of breezes in the morning mm-hmm. um, with Express Bet and a couple other things that have been. Uh, so that I don't know if that's so much the, the Stronic group or if it's the company Express Bet themselves that has been doing it. Um, but that's a big help to try to help with the corruption of faking published works yes if that makes makes sense yeah uh, a, a question from carolyn uh jesse do you taper into a race like swimmers do or distance runners do you do you taper the horse's uh training regimen now what do you mean by taper like uh you uh, know uh, uh, you uh, slowly back off on how um how much they're working out the physical oh, okay. nature so, yeah so that depends on, on each, each horse, each individual horse. Now, a horse – so let's use Fear the Turtle, for example. Um, you know, when, when he ran the first time that we ran him, we had some issues with, you know, with being allowed to run him on a certain day and things like that. So we, we had a lot of time in between when we claimed him and when we got to run him the first time. So if you, if you were to look Fear the Turtle up and look at his work schedule – in that period of time, we were extremely aggressive with him just because we weren't sure when we were going to get to running. And we knew he was a, going to have to run in a, you know, a tough allowance race. So we needed him on his toes. So 
when we once we realized when we were going to get the running, about two weeks out, you could see his times on his works. His his final work was a lot slower than what it was previous to that. And so I, I don't know if I if you say we taper them, but we definitely start to slow them down and let them start to save some energy a little bit. Um, but with that being said, there are some horses that are very, very high, strong horses that you don't want them so high, strong. So you'll keep their training normal to try to keep them relaxed, if that makes sense, to kind of burn off some of that nervous energy. Um, you know, the first time Trapped in My Mind ever ran, she trained the morning of her race. Uh, because as a two-year-old, she was very, very much on her toes and very much so um, just had had a lot of nervous energy that I, I was worried that she would get to the paddock and misbehave and things like that in the paddock because of how much nervous energy she, she kind of had. So we trained her that morning to, A, one, kind of keep her routine the same, and then also to burn off some of that nervous energy. Um, and if anybody that's on – you know, on the call today was at was at her race, her first start. You'll remember that she was very calm and cool and collective in the paddock. Um, but typically, you, you with younger horses, you don't taper them back because you want them just staying on their routine and staying the schedule. So, yet again, it's you have to individualize it between each horse, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. that's how I've always been taught to train and how I how I continue to train. Mm -hmm. So. I'm going to finish up, Jess, with a couple questions around uh, the day, staying on that day of the life of a, of a racehorse. Talk to me a little bit about what race day is for a horse. What does that look like? So like I said, each, uh, each, there are some horses that will train that morning and keep their routine the same. But most horses will, will, won't train that morning. They'll, they'll get out. The, the day will start the same as it always does. You know. Three o'clock breakfast, four o'clock, the brooms are there starting their stalls. Um, about 5.30, if the horse isn't training, typically it'll go out to get a bath then, um, and it'll walk for 30 minutes or so, and then it'll go back in the stall. And uh, then we'll keep everything, basically we'll try to keep their schedule pretty much the same. They'll get fed at the same time until they get Lasix. Once the horse gets Lasix, which is a mandatory four hours before the race, uh, you'll take the, the hay and the, the grain from them to so those four hours. And our typical schedule is, um, so they'll get Lasix at four hours. In the summertime, at three hours before the race, they'll come out. They'll get another bath to make sure they're clean. They'll go back to the stall, and then they'll stand in ice, which is ice boots, to help start uh, cooling the legs and, and helping with that situation um, for about an hour, an hour before the race. And then we'll will run their vet wrap and hang their bridle on them. So if they're in the, say they're in the second race, when the first race is going to, into the gate, you'll start putting the bridle and things like that on them. And uh, depending on the weather, if it's extremely hot, you'll, you'll spray them off again and, and try to help cool them down. Um, and then you'll walk over and they'll run in the race and then they'll cool out for 40 minutes afterwards. And they'll, they'll go back into the stall and, and, you know, be fed again a couple hours later. Hmm. do you know and i I've, I've been around it if if a horse runs well does their attitude change yes <laughs> you know it's it's uh it's kind of funny um you know I, I i think when i when i explain that to people i think they look at me sometimes and think that i'm just a crazy horse guy or you know that's what we do um but there are horses that definitely enjoy what they do and and realize hey we you know I, I won this race um you know trapped in my mind is a horse that hasn't won but every time she walks out of that stall to go to that racetrack she she knows that it what her job is to do and it shows in her form and how hard she tries every time she runs in some of the, some of the tougher races honestly um but there are definitely horses that that definitely do understand what we're asking them to do and enjoy enjoy beating other horses in, in a race. Um, I, I, like I said, I think it's, I think if you, you spend a lot of time with them, you can see that um, and, and witness it. And honestly, it's one of the, one of the things 
why I enjoy training young horses is when, when they start realizing, Hey, this is actually fun, you know? Um, and the light bulb starts going off on, on, on them a little bit and they start realizing, you know, that they're, they're winning or this or that, you know, it, it's really nice um, to see. Mm-hmm. So, uh, a question from Chantel is how do you manage ulcers when they haven't had anything to eat for four hours? So I don't, so I don't think that that is a big cause of, of, of ulcers in the racing you got to think too, as an, as an athlete, you don't eat a big meal an hour before your race or before your, your football game or this or that uh, basketball game or whatever you're, you're playing, you know, obviously you eat um, beforehand, but horses are, are, are very large animals, but a lot of people don't realize that their, their stomachs aren't, aren't extremely big. So a horse is actually supposed to eat small meals often throughout the day. So them not having a, a meal for four hours isn't, isn't something that extremely causes ulcers to me the situation that causes ulcers for thoroughbreds is more so being being stuck in a stall more more than what they really should be because of them need, needing to be protected and not needing to be out running around cutting themselves running full tilt through fields and things like that so by us protecting them in that sense we sometimes we hinder them with like you said with ulcers and then what we do from there is we put them on, on ulcer supplements like omeprazole. Um, us at, for wasabi, we buy a product called, called U7, which is a nat- all natural ulcer aid. Um, but they make a lot of different, different products to try to help with, with ulcers because it is something that, that does hurt the horses. But like I said, I think it's, it's something that, um, that's caused more by them being in the stall more often than it is from them just not getting uh, any grain for four hours before the race, which they, you got to think they don't race every day. They, they, they only run maybe twice a month at the most. Um, so that's kind of my answer for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. So Jess, I'm uh, close up with a question for you. And um, if you, uh, if you were going to ch- be able to change one thing about the way American thoroughbred racehorse training happens, what would be the thing that you would want to change? I, I'd want to change the way we train in the morning. Um, I think the, you know, obviously you have to, you have to start somewhat early. Um, but the, the way it's, I don't know if it's so much us training in the morning, but the, the way we have to only train over a dirt racetrack around a circle, the same direction every day, if that makes sense, where you watch those guys, if you follow racing a lot, you watch a lot of the European guys gallop uphill in a straight line. They have to walk across the field to get to the place where they actually train at. You know, it's spread out. They have big, massive yards that they train on. And um, they can do different things with their horses. If, if that's the big thing that I think um, – that I would change in the way that we do it. And it would, and then what, obviously what that does is it, it spreads out us only having four hours to be able to train our horses in the morning. You have to think we have, we only have nine horses here at Mama's right now, but think about how, how much help and how rushed things have to be when you have, you know, a hundred horses in training, like, like Todd Fletcher or, or, or more really than what they have at different tracks or, you know, like Chad and Asmussen and those guys, it makes things, it makes you rush a little bit more where in in Europe, they kind of have all day to do that. Um, So those are the things that that I would change about Mm -hmm. the way, the style in which we train here. Um, You know, it just would, it makes things more horse friendly if we, if we didn't have to, to train in those four hours. You know, if you had if you had a lot more time, it would it would make the whole situation of training horses more more horse friendly. So then they're out of the stall more often, which then helps with the situation of uh, of ulcers and just them being horses at the same time. Um, you know, mm-hmm. absolutely. No, great. No, thanks, Jess. This was a, a really great uh, session. Um, really good questions from folks and. And, uh, you know, I always, uh, always appreciate when we can open the kimono a little bit and talk, uh, about what happens, uh, on the, on, 
when no one's really getting to watch. Uh, so much of this is hidden from the racing public. Um, so it's nice to be able to, to spend the time and actually dig into a lot of it. So thanks for your time tonight, Jess. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you guys for, for having me. All right. Hey, thanks, everybody. Enjoy, enjoy your night, and uh, we'll see you on Slack. <laughs>